thank you. Uh, I th I'd like to thank Auburn University and Auburn Extension and our host Brenda Ortiz for inviting me here today. Uh, again, my name is David Zierden. I'm with Florida State University. And even, even though I'm with FSU, I've been a lifelong Gator fan, so you can thank us for sending you Will Muschamp and a defense for next year. But uh, uh, at Florida State, we've been involved in a partnership called the Southeast Climate Consortium for over a dozen years now. And this consortium uh, includes partners from Auburn University, uh, University of Alabama, Huntsville, Georgia, uh, Clemson University, North Carolina State, and uh, University of Florida. So we've been working closely with extension and with agriculture for over a dozen years now. So I'm feeling more and more at home uh, with this kind of uh, crowd and this topic. Uh, before I get too much into my talk, I want to go over some basic concepts. And the first one is, uh, there we go. I want to talk first about what, what we mean and the difference between weather and climate. And uh, I think everyone's got a good intuition of what that means, but uh, real simply, weather is the current conditions outside uh, of the atmosphere, uh, usually measured by with temperature, rainfall, uh, barometric pressure, winds, humidity. And when we talk about weather, we talk about the minute to minute, hour by hour, day to day, -to -day changes. Uh, especially as uh, modulated by the comings and goings of individual weather systems, air masses, cold fronts, low pressure systems, that kind of thing. And uh, weather, when usually when we're talking about weather, the time horizon goes out from the current conditions to as far as 10 days in the future. But when we talk about climate, kind of the old view of climate was just the average weather over time, usually a 30 year period. But that really doesn't do climate justice. Uh, climate is more than just a long-term average. It includes, uh, uh, it includes knowledge about the variability of the weather patterns and climate patterns. Uh, a better definition is climate is the slowly varying aspects of our earth, ocean, and atmosphere system together. Uh, and uh, going into that, uh, uh, Weather is, is fairly predictable out one to even five days in advance with these sophisticated weather prediction models. And, it's, and these predictions are very, uh, they're very dependent on the initial conditions. That's why we have such a robust observation system in this country and around the world and send up weather balloons twice a day to sample the atmosphere at all different levels. Uh, and, and it's dominated by the initial conditions. Climate is more, kind of the average of the weather and it's modulated by things uh, by external forcings like sea surface temperatures, snow and ice cover, uh, the solar intensity or radiance hitting the earth and the concentration of greenhouse gases. All these help modulate climate. So it's kind of a different mechanism when we're looking at changes in weather and changes in climate. And there's some other nice little uh, anecdotes and sayings on comparing weather and climate. Uh, popular one, weather is your mood, climate is your personality. Uh, another, I've also heard it say, weather is what you wore today, where climate is the wardrobe in your closet. Uh, more recently, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the host of uh, Cosmos uh, now, he had a whole episode on climate and climate change, and, what, and he used this illustration. He was uh, walking his dog down the beach and he had the dog on the leash and the dog was wandering to and fro like they tend to do. But he was keeping a straight line and he said, weather is the dog changing from day to day and week to week where climate is more slow and steady. So keep your eye on the, the person, not the dog. Uh, one more term I want to kind of introduce is climate variability. And to illustrate this, I have a couple different graphs. Uh, on the top left is the average annual temperature for the state of Alabama from 1895 to the present. And on the bottom right, it's annual rainfall averaged over the state for the same time period, 1895 to present. And if we look at temperature, we can see some interesting things going on. First of all, there's no real trend. 
the southeast United States is one area of the globe that really hasn't seen an increase in temperature due to the accumulation of greenhouse gases. Uh, it's re really unusual. The western United States, especially the higher latitudes, are all warming significantly. But the southeast U.S. is one area that hasn't. Also, you'll notice the 1930s were actually the warmest decade on record here in Alabama. Uh, some, a lot of the high temperature records were set in the, in the 1930s and even 50s. Then about 1958, there was kind of an abrupt shift where we had several cold decades in a, in a row. And now in recent decades, we've returned more towards normal. But you'll also notice there's tremendous year-to-year -year variability in, in this climate record. And that's what I want to focus on today. And if we look at rainfall, it's even more pronounced. There's, there's really no trend. There's none of this decadal variations that we see in temperature, but it's just this tremendous year-to-year -year variations where the risk lies. You can have a record-setting low years of uh, less than 35 inches for the year or over 75 for a given year. Uh, so it's that year-to-year -year variability is where the, the, the real risk and challenges and opportunity lie. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, a tool that gives us a little bit of predictability of, this, of these year-to-year -year variations, especially in the colder weather months, November through March. And that mechanism is the El Nino-La Nina cycle. Uh, just show of hands, how many have heard these terms or are kind of familiar with how they affect our weather and climate? That's good, everybody has. So a lot of this will be review. Uh, but real simply, El Nino is a phenomenon that returns every two to seven years. Uh, it's this area of the Pacific Ocean along the equator from the coast of South America all the way out to the International Dateline where every two to seven years this area will Will, will really warm like gangbusters. It'll, it'll, it'll warm several degrees uh, Celsius warmer than it normally is, which is a huge change when you're talking about the tropical Pacific Ocean. And th this is a satellite image of the great El Nino of 1997-98. Here the well, ocean temperatures were, uh, were five degrees Celsius or more warmer than normal uh, during that winter. It caused enormous impacts around the globe, this presence of warm water in the Pacific. The opposite phase, and again it occurs every two to seven years, is called La Nina. And that's where that same area of the Pacific Ocean or a similar area along the equator cools down several degrees colder than normal. And it has its own set of impacts on the, the, the climate of the northern hemisphere, North America, and other parts of the world. So real quickly, a little background on what causes this warming and cooling in this part of the, uh, of the ocean. This is just a diagram of the normal state of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's dominated at the surface by these easterly trade winds. If, if you've ever been in the tropics, the trade winds blow east to west almost all the time continuously. Unless there's a hurricane or a real big weather system in place, you're going to get these easterly trade winds. And because of these persistent easterly trade winds, it leads to cold water and nutrient-rich water upwelling off South America and even to a lesser degree off California. But also the warm water piles up over in the western Pacific and this is known as the Pacific Warm Pool. Some of the warmest ocean temperatures in the world right here and these warm ocean temperatures support a lot of cloudiness and rainfall and thunderstorm activity that we call conve convection. So this is the normal state of the Pacific Ocean. Now what happens to, when an El Nino is forming is over here in the western Pacific, these trade winds are disrupted. They, they fall close to nothing or can even reverse and become westerly. And that will set, set in place a chain reaction of, of events that helps build an El Nino. Uh, a little closer look at uh, some of the, these things I was talking about. This is just a 30 year climatology of sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean. Here in the red, you see sea surface temperatures approaching 30 degrees Celsius or 85 degrees Fahrenheit over in the western Pacific, much cooler over here in the eastern Pacific and along the equator. And that's the normal state. Now this next slide is going to show the departures from normal over a two-year period from 1997 through 1999 
where a lot was going on in the Pacific. We had this big El Nino form in 1997-98, and it was followed immediately by a fairly strong La Nina, or cooler ocean temperatures. And this is going to show anomalies, which are the departures from normal. The warmer will be in red, the coolers will be in blue. So here we go, as we start 1997, you see this explosion of warm water in this El Nino region. And it really intensified during the winter. And then you saw this abrupt change to colder than normal in 1998-99. And we'll let it run one more time. That's, so that really illustrates this cycle in the Pacific Ocean. Now historically, we don't have this kind of action every year. We, we usually have an El Nino one out of four years, a La Nina one out of four years, and the other two years are close to normal or neutral. So it's usually only one out of four years that we have either this El Nino or La Nina affecting our weather. Well, the first big El Nino was in 1982 and 83, and because the Pacific Ocean is so vast, there's very few observations of ocean temperatures and weather conditions. And in 1982 and 83 was the first great El Nino of this century that really caused catastrophic uh, impacts, flooding and coastal erosion in California, terrible droughts in Australia and parts of South America, uh, very rainy winters here in the, in the southeast and in Florida. So that really opened the eyes of the scientific community that this Pacific Ocean is something we need to pay attention to. So through an international effort, a series of weather buoys that monitor the, both the atmospheric conditions and the oceanic temperatures and currents down several hundred meters were deployed across the whole Pacific Ocean. Everywhere there's one of these little blue dots is one of these weather buoys. And they telemeter their, telemeter their data back via satellite real time so now that we can, we really have a great monitoring system and can pay attention to the Pacific Ocean day to day. One editorial comment, due to budget constraints in the last few years and basically mismanagement, a lot of these buoys in the eastern Pacific have gone offline. And I think that's one of the reasons we've had such a hard time getting a handle on this current El Nino and predicting whether it would go ahead and develop or, or not. So I, I think that's been part of the problem. But we can, we can show the historical changes in the Pacific Oceans, the comings and goings of the El Ninos and La Ninas, by just taking the sea surface temperatures in this area of the Pacific Ocean along the equator is called the Nino 3.4 area and just the, the departures from normal month by month and plot them on a timeline. Here we're starting in 1950 on the top left and going through 1970 all the way to the current 2012 and even 2014 on the bottom right. And some things that'll jump that I want to point out about this graph, we have these dotted lines at plus or minus half degree Celsius. That's the commonly accepted threshold for being an El Nino or La Nina strength. And then you see when the temperatures are warm, we have these orange uh, spikes or humps. These are the El Ninos. The blue valleys are when it's colder than normal. These are the La Ninas. And here you see the big El, El Nino of 1982-83. Again in 1997 and 98. Our most recent El Nino was in 2009-2010. But another thing to notice is that El Ninos are typically one-year events, where the La Ninas are often two or three years in a row, more, most recently in uh, 2011 through 2012. That has big implications for us because La Nina, as I'll show you in just a few slides, tends to bring the southeast uh, a much warmer and drier winter. And that can often be the trigger for drought. And when you have two or three of these La Ninas in a row, it sets the stage for multi-year droughts here in the southeast. Like back in the 2000s, you know, 1999 through 2001, we had terrible drought down here. The 1950s, 54 through 56, the 1970s. All of these multi-year droughts were influenced in some way by this multi-year La Nina. So, Real quick, how, does these, how do these ocean temperatures feed back into the atmosphere and, and affect our weather patterns? Well, these diagrams show it pretty clearly. When you have an El Nino, 
this warm water that's usually confined to the western Pacific spreads across the whole basin. And with that warm water is this thunderstorm activity and convection. And this is a very efficient mechanism for transferring heat and, and heat and moisture and heat energy from the ocean surface into the upper atmosphere. Now when a La Nina is in place, it pushes this convection very far to the west and confines it to the far western Pacific, and we get a different type of circulation. And by just the presence or absence of this heat and humidity source pumping into the upper atmosphere, it changes our jet stream patterns. The top is the preferred or the predominant jet stream pattern we see in, during an El Nino year. And it's dominated by this strong subtropical jet stream that taps this Pacific moisture. It brings uh, storminess and winter storms to, to California and the, the, and the western United States. And these storms frequently redevelop along the northern Gulf Coast, tapping the Gulf moisture, and bring us very frequent rainfall and storminess during these El Nino episodes. And a little foreshadowing, we've seen uh, California getting hit two or three weeks in a row by what they call the Pineapple Express, kind of a good indication that something's going on in the Pacific Ocean. When we have a La Nina in place, then now the polar jet stream is the more dominant jet stream. Uh, it tends to follow a path that steers the storms up the Mississippi and Ohio Valley, but down here in, in, along the northern Gulf Coast in Florida, we frequently get, get left out. The, 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 most of the storm energy is far to our north, leaving us warmer and drier in the winter months. And when I'm talking about the winter months, it, it usually feel these impacts from basically November through March. And this, this is a better way of quantifying those impacts. If you group all the El Nino events together and just look at how it affects our rainfall patterns, this shows for January when you group all the El Ninos together, it leads to rainfall that's 40 to 60 percent above normal for the peninsula of Florida. But that above normal even extends well up into Georgia, into central Alabama also. Not so much in northern Alabama, not near as much of an impact. Uh, it can also affect summer weather when we have an onset of El Nino, the, the late summer is often drier than normal. As this graph shows, uh, 10 to 20 percent drier than normal on the onset of an El Nino. Conversely, when we have La Nina or the cold water in place, we see much the opposite impact. Starting in fall, we see the whole southeast is 10 to 30 percent drier than normal. As we get into the winter, that pattern really intensifies over the peninsula of Florida. Now you can only expect half the normal rainfall uh, when you have a La Nina in place. Some other impacts from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, uh, this cycle has a big impact on the, on the tropical cyclone activity in the Atlantic and Pacific Basin. And real quickly, we just took a uh, hundred years of the strongest hurricanes, the Category 3 hurricanes that made landfall in the United States, and plotted them in the two different phases, El Nino and La Nina. You see when there's an El Nino in place, we have relatively fewer hurricane strikes, over twice as many when a La Nina is in place. And kind of the, the generally accepted model there is that when you have an El Nino and all this uh, excess moisture and heat energy going into the upper atmosphere, it leads to unfavorable winds over the hurricane formation region or, or shear that tend to blow apart the storms before they form. And this year we have had a, another relatively inactive season as predicted uh, because we anticipated an El Nino forming in the Pacific. So what we've seen this year is right in line with, uh, with what we'd expect from El Nino. Now this doesn't necessarily have to do with this El Nino, La Nina cycle, but it's an interesting fact. We're in a hurricane drought right now, believe it or not. Uh, it has been nine years since a major hurricane, category three or higher, has hit anywhere in the United States. Wilma was the last one that hit South Florida back in 2005. And this shows that that's by far the longest streak without a major hurricane in the historical record. Very similar thing for the state of Florida. The state of Florida has not been hit by any hurricane of any strength since Wilma in 2005. Again, over nine years, twice as long as any his other historical streak. 
So it's just kind of an anomaly, but we are in this hurricane drought. I don't think we can read anything into it. It's likely not to continue. We're, we're going to get hit sooner or later, and we need to be prepared. So let's get to the good stuff. Why is this El Nino, La Nina cycle important to us in these changes in climate patterns? Because it has a direct impact on agricultural production. Here's one example. This is just taking the National Agricultural Statistics Service, their historic county yield statistics for corn over a 50 or so year period, and doing the same thing we do with the weather data, we break it into the, into the different categories, whether you have El Nino or La Nina. And we looked at the departures from normal for these corn yields county by county. And we call them residuals. That's a fancy term because there's also a trend due to uh, technology and, and advancements in cultivars and things like that. So these residuals are just a departure from that trend line. But anyway, when you have an El Nino in place, corn yields are generally down from 10 to 35% over the entire southeast. On the other hand, when you have a La Nina or the warmer, drier winters, seem to increase corn yields across this whole uh, southeast region. And what we think is going on there is, uh, one, these, these agricultural statistics do not separate between irrigated and rain-fed. So for the La Nina case, a lot of this corn is irrigated. You have a warmer spring, a lot more sunshine, more solar radiation, so you get ahead on the growth curve and the yields just respond due to the, the increase in sunshine and earlier warm temperatures. Now, th I don't know that this, this uh, uh, measure is this important to corn and, and wheat production, but it also has a big impact on the number of chill hours or chill accumulation during the winter time. And that's very important for flowering fruits, uh, blueberries, peaches, strawberries, things like that. And as you'd expect, uh, when an El Nino's in place and we generally get these cooler, wetter winters, there's a, 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 there's a great uh, 70 to 90 percent chance that you'll get less than the normal amount of chill hours for your region. On the other hand, a La Nina with the warmer, drier winters, there's only a 10 to 20, 10 to 30 percent chance that you'll get less than normal. So there's a really good chance that you'll get, wait, I'm saying that all backwards. Back up, back up. El Nino with the cooler, wetter winters, a great chance that you're going to get more than your normal chill accumulation. That makes sense. La Nina with the warmer, drier, there's a good chance that you will not reach your normal uh, your or anticipated chill accumulation. So let's talk about some fun stuff. Let's talk about some recent events. Uh, we had quite the chill here in November. Uh, this shows uh, morning low temperatures f across the region on the morning of, uh, I believe it was November 20th. Uh, 15 up here in Auburn, uh, 21 down in southeast Alabama, 23 in Tallahassee. This came close, there was even some teens in North Florida, and this came close to setting a record for the earliest occurrence of temperatures in the teens for the state of Florida. Uh, missed it by two days, but it, it was close to the record, and it was certainly set a lot of uh, daily records during this morning. Here's a re really interesting graph from Monticello in North Florida right to the east of Tallahassee. This shows the temperature at the agricultural fawn station. It dropped very quickly right after sunset, reached 32 degrees about 6.30 that evening, and did not rise above freezing until 9 o'clock the following morning, over 14 and a half hours below freezing. Uh, so good thing we don't have a lot of citrus production in North Florida. I think it might have affected some satsuma uh, growers around uh, southern Alabama and North Florida. but. We also had very high dew points during this freeze. It led to a heavy accumulation of frost, or I call this North Florida snow. But because of that cold snap and some others, it was actually one of the coldest Novembers on record for the southeast. Here's the historical rankings. The, the pinks are in the top five, second coldest in Auburn, southeast Alabama, a lot of ones here in North Florida. So very cold November. And 
because of that, and kind of a, our also kind of backs up our conceptual model of El Nino, this shows chill hour accumulation. Uh, this is at Russell County, Alabama, just to our south, I believe. The orange line is the normal or average chill accumulation beginning at October 1st. This line is what we've witnessed, and you see we're well ahead of the, of the normal curve, almost twice as many chill hours as we normally would have at this time of the year. So all that's good background, but we really want to know what's happening this year. So let's, let's take a look. And I'm, I apologize that some of these slides are going to get kind of complicated and technical, but bear with me. They tell a good story. I told you it was the changes in winds over the western Pacific Ocean that kind of initiate an El Nino. Well, this, this graph shows near surface winds from back in February and March, kind of a 30-day time period. And you see uh, very strong and persistent westerly winds over here in the Pacific Ocean. And this is a time longitude plot called a Hovmuller plot. But the way to look at it is everywhere you have one of these orange blobs, that's an occurrence of westerly winds over in that area of the Pacific Ocean. And we can see one distinct episode in, in uh, January and early February, another one in late February and March, and yet another one in April. So we had these three big episodes of westerly winds over the Pacific Ocean. And that set in place a chain reaction of what we call a Kelvin wave, where where the water below the surface, actually the, thir the depth of the thermocline actually de deepens as this Kelvin wave moves from Indonesia and Australia over to South America. It takes about one and a half months for one of these waves to traverse the Pacific Ocean. But here you, you see where it's finishing its journey. And so now the water below the surface, several hundred meters below the surface, is much, much warmer than it normally is. And you, even at the surface, you can see some warming initiating. So w that happened back in April and May. It, uh, it, it was such a strong Kelvin wave that a lot of the scientists thought this might even be one of the big El Nino events. But then during the summer, the westerly winds stopped and the sea surface temperatures almost returned to normal. Well, since then, in the last couple of months, we've had a couple more weaker westerly wind events another weaker Kelvin wave, but now the sea surface temperatures are really starting to respond. This shows uh, sea surface temperature anomalies as of a week or so ago of one to two to even two and a half degrees Celsius, starting to look like the classic El Nino signature there. And if we look at this second from the top graph, this is that same Nino 3.4 index that I showed you earlier, and here you you can see how it was kind of cooler than normal in the Pacific back in the winter time. Then in April and May with that first Kelvin wave, it warmed almost to that 0.5 degree threshold. Then it kind of fell apart in July and August, returned to normal. But now it's kicking back in in full gear. Now the, the Nino 3.4 index is up to one degree Celsius above normal, well above the El Nino thresholds, and it looks like it's going to persist for the next several months. So with that said, and with the uh, weak to moderate El Ninos showing itself and being in place, uh, this is NOAA's official climate outlook for the wintertime, December, January, and February. And this shows their temperature outlook, an increased uh, chance of colder than normal temperatures across the southern U.S., uh, again, very uh, consistent with what we know about El Nino. Our precipitation outlook, an increased chance of above normal precipitation for the southwest, Texas, Florida, and the southeast. That same pattern I showed you on those uh, maps earlier that showed the typical El Nino impacts, There's, you'll notice that same pattern. So NOAA is banking on this El Nino being in place all winter and influencing our winter climate patterns. Some other signs that El Nino's, whether the sea surface temperature said so or not, that at least the atmosphere was responding like El Nino. Uh, we, we did have a dry summer in the southeast. Actually, Tallahassee had a, a, its record driest summer when you talk about June, July, and August. Uh, the inactive Atlantic hurricane season, the very active eastern Pacific 
hurricane season with the with the hurricanes hitting Baja, Mexico, and stuff. That that's very consistent with El Nino. Uh, this pineapple express that's kicking in in California again it shows that strong subtropical jet stream and tapping that moisture from the tropical Pacific. Uh, I'm kind of saying El Nino's here and we need to plan accordingly. Uh, some of the other forecast centers are not fully on board yet. NOAA is still holding at a 65% chance that it'll be in place during the winter time. Uh, the Australians who monitor this very closely, they're a little more bullish at 70%. Klaus Walter, who I respect greatly, uh, noted El Nino expert, he's more confident than that. He says 80 to 90% that it's here and will remain in place. So uh, I'll finish up here. Uh, all this information on El Nino and climate variability can be found at agroclimate.org. Uh, shameless plug, uh, Brenda Ortiz has done a great job putting together several flyers on the impacts of El Nino on La Nina on our climate and even on corn and wheat in particular and some management options. So I believe those are available in the other room. On the, I had encourage you to pick them up and read through them. And please go, visit agroclimate.org, uh, contact your extension uh, professional. They can help you navigate the tools and get used to them. But there is it's a whole host of information down to the county level on this climate variability and how this El Nino, La Nina cycle affects our climate. So with that, I'll wrap up and be glad to take any questions. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, I was on the fence, or the whole science was, for the last several months because it was, it was like on again, off again. It was right there on the threshold. But now, now it looks like it's, it's got some momentum. And it'll, yeah, it's a pretty sure bet that a, at least a week El Nino will be in place uh, through the winter months. All right, thank you.